Welcome everyone to the Federal Bar Association, Maryland chapter and the Metropolitan Washington Employment Lawyers Association's fall webinar, Effective Summary Judgment Practice in Federal Court. I'm Scott Oswald. I am Amwila's Bench Bar Committee Chair and your moderator for today's program. Before we begin, Jamie Luce, board member of the Federal Bar Association, Maryland chapter, has joined us to tell us a little bit about the chapter and the benefits of membership. Jamie? Thank you, Scott. Good afternoon, everyone. Scott mentioned, my name is Jamie Luce, and I'm a partner at the law firm of Tidings and Rosenberg in Baltimore, Maryland, where I focus a significant portion of my practice on the defense of employers. It's also my pleasure to welcome you to what promises to be an informative and engaging program. Scott mentioned I'm on the board of the Maryland chapter of the Federal Bar Association. Before we get started, I want to invite and encourage you to join the Federal Bar Association, particularly the Maryland chapter. I think you will find it valuable as it enhances your practice in the District of Maryland. The Maryland chapter has approximately 300 members who regularly practice in federal court within Maryland. Joining the Maryland chapter provides unparalleled opportunities to network with your peers and members of the bench. You will also have access to insightful continuing legal, legal education seminars and programming, including the annual Introduction to Federal Practice Series, State of the Court Address from the Chief Judge, Supreme Court Review, and one of my personal favorites, Fireside Chats with Judges to get to know them and understand their practice preference. Our next Fireside Chat is with Judge Grig Grigsby on December 16th, 2022 at noon. So I encourage you to visit the chapter's website for more information. You can uh, locate that at www.fbamd.org. Thank you, and I'll turn things back over to Scott. Jamie, thanks so much. And now to our participants in today's roundtable. The Honorable Pamela Harris is a United States Circuit Court judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Before her appointment, Judge Harris worked in private practice for over 10 years, primarily as a Supreme Court and appellate litigator. She served twice as the United States Department of Justice as a Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Policy from 2010 to 2012 and as an Attorney Advisor at the Office of Legal Counsel from 1993 to 1996. The Honorable Theodore Shuang is a United States District Judge for the District of Maryland and sits at the U.S. Courthouse in Greenbelt. Judge Wong served as Deputy General Counsel of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security from 2011 to 2014 and as Associate General Counsel of the DHS from 2009 to 2011. From, two th from 1995 to 1998, Judge Wong served as a trial attorney at the U.S. Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. Pooja Sriji is an associate at Outman Golden's Washington, D.C. office and is a member of the firm's class and collective action practice group. Pooja represents employees in a wide range of class action discrimination cases and wage and hour lawsuits. Teresa Teer is a partner at Shaw Rosenthal. Teresa represents employers and management in labor and employment related litigation. Teresa is the Best Lawyers in America 2023 Baltimore Lawyer of the Year in the category of litigation, labor, and employment law. I'll take your questions throughout today's program. Just use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, Judge Shuang, good afternoon. I'd like to begin with you. Uh, let's dive in with motions for summary judgment. Do you require that a party filing a motion for summary judgment seek your permission before filing? Well, thank you, Scott, and uh, thank you all for having me here as part of the program. I'm excited to uh, talk about this issue with, with members of the bar. Um, so I do, although I actually just in general have a standing practice, which is in a case management order that's issued at the beginning of every civil case that does require a, initially a notice of your intent to file a motion. And then we usually have a, a, a case management conference where we discuss the motion. Um, it's not designed to prevent you from following the motion. It's more about addressing time, place, and manner issues regarding the motion. So among other things that can come up are, you know, if, if I think that it's being filed prematurely or it's in the middle of discovery and it may be more efficient to wait till the end of discovery to actually file the motion, that may be something we'll discuss. 
Um, sometimes both sides want to file cross motions and we'll try to um, determine the right briefing order and things like that. Um, and then other times, uh, if it's clearly a fa- there's clearly a factual dispute, we may have a discussion about whether the motion's even needed at all. So I do require that again, something I do for all major substantive motions anyways, but particularly for summary judgment motions. So let's talk about from your perspective when they are advisable, when in those clear cases where you say this, this is the type of case where summary judgment probably should be filed. Well, one area is if it's really a pure legal question. So, um, and, you know, if there's a, an issue that comes up in a contract or if it's sometimes exhaustion of administrative remedies in these em- employment cases, if there's a clear cut legal question there, then certainly summary judgment would be warranted. Um, those are probably the only scenarios I would think you would want to or need to file a motion before the end of discovery at the summary judgment level. Um, although parties often try to do jump the gun in my view and, and, and try to argue the facts before they're all developed. Um, and then the other, of course, is at the close of discovery. If, um, again, ideally a legal question, but if it's a, a factual dispute and one side feels as if the facts are completely deficient on a certain issue, certainly well, that is something to consider, understanding that, of course, if there's a genuine issue of material fact, the motion is going to get denied. So I'm kind of hearing from you that at least before prior to the end of discovery, generally you're disfavoring a filing of a motion for summary judgment. Do I, do I have that right? Uh, I, I think so, because, you know, for better or for worse, the federal rules do not set a particular time or when a summary judgment motion should be filed or a limit on how many can be filed. On the other hand, given the volume of cases we have, um, to have multiple summary judgments in the same motions in the same case is very, very disruptive to the docket, uh, particularly for other cases that uh, also are seeking uh, the court's time. And so to try to at least funnel it into a situation where if you're going to have a summary judgment motion or different parties want to file summary judgment motions, we do it all at the same time once is my goal. And I think that's that's one of the reasons for that pro- approach. Thank you. Teresa. I want to bring you in at this point. Talk to us from the defense uh, perspective. When do you ever file, let's say, a pre-discovery summary judgment motion? Thank you, Scott, and I'm happy to be here with all of you today. Um, It's very rare that, uh, as defense attorneys, we're going to be filing a pre-discovery motion for summary judgment. As Judge Schwong mentioned, uh, the facts aren't really developed at that point, and we know that the judges aren't ready to decide those motions at that time. I think I've only done it maybe once or twice in my career, And if there's a purely legal issue, like the judge mentioned, um, in employment cases, that could be if there's a joint employment issue or integrated employer, where we're trying to get one of the defendants who we argue is not actually the the employee's employer out of the case. Um, And even then, um, often the plaintiffs will file an affidavit saying that they need additional discovery on those issues. Um, And so I've had it where judges have allowed discovery Um, on that one particular issue. But at the end of the day, if you're going to go through discovery and the cost of discovery, then it's more efficient, in my opinion, to go through discovery on all the issues in the case. From your perspective, what are the risks from the defense perspective in filing an early summary judgment motion? Well, I think one is making the judge upset which is always a consideration um, that we we want to prevent. Um, in addition, it's we do not want to give a roadmap to the other side as to the issues in their case. So I know that obviously, um, you know, there's there's issues where I can file a motion and I'm basically giving the other side a roadmap to amend their complaint or add additional claims. So that's when that's the risk. Of, of filing a premature motion, in my opinion. Judge Wong, uh, Civil Procedure Rule 56D allows the non-moving party to uh, submit an affidavit in which they talk about the additional discovery that they need uh, in order to oppose summary judgment. Um, just a, a few things. Your advice in preparing that affidavit, what are some things that the non-moving party should think about in putting in that affidavit so that it's helpful to you? Well, yes. And I think that um, 
That is something that can come up earlier on. I mean, you know, obviously seeing the full spectrum of cases, we do get what I consider a decent number of early uh, summary judgment motions. And so when the non-moving party wants to uh, move to discovery uh, rather than having to re- with and seeks information in order to respond, I think the, the main thing is just having an affidavit that isn't just a boilerplate affidavit that says I need discovery. Um, you might win with that if it's if it's clearly obvious to me what you need discovery for. But if it's not, it, it's better to have some specificity. I don't think you need to lay out all the discovery you necessarily would ask for, but at least, you know, at a minimum one, but ideally two or three categories of information that you can describe would be helpful to or, if, or helpful or necessary to help you uh, respond to the motion that you just don't have. And so I think having some specificity is important. Who signs the affidavit? Is it the lawyer, the, the client? I mean, under our rules, uh, local rules, I mean, an attorney can do that. And uh, again, the attorney is the one who's best positioned to understand what discovery is needed more than the client. So we're, we're, we'll certainly accept the uh, counsel's representations. Thank you. Pooja, affirmative motions for summary judgment. Uh, when do you consider filing them from the employee side? From the employee side, we're not often filing the affirmative motions, uh, although one area where I think it's useful to pause and think about filing one is when it comes to affirmative defenses. If there are affirmative defenses that can be knocked out at summary judgment, for example, as the judge mentioned, uh, if there's like a statute of limitations or latches argument or failure to exhaust if there are clear legal issues, uh, that would be a consideration. But you know, generally, the, the rule should really just be to not move for summary judgment if you're relying on disputed facts. And as plaintiffs, we're often you know, making the argument in opposition that when it comes to uh, discrimination cases, for example, motive and inferences, these are all disputed facts that should be reserved for the jury. Thank you. Teresa, not every case is positioned for summary judgment. Give us um, a a little sense of, and and some are, but uh, give us a little sense of the admonitions that you give your associates when they are writing, you know, maybe their first brief uh, in support of, of summary judgment, what kind of advice are you giving them about preparing that motion and an outline to go with it? Sure. Well, I think uh, the hallmark of a good defense attorney is outlining the issues and defenses early on, as early as you can in the case, to identify what the legal arguments are going to be, what the plaintiff has to prove, and what the defenses are. So you want to do that, create a roadmap early on, and that guides you through the discovery process, whether it's taking the plaintiff's deposition or gathering information through discovery requests. And then in framing the summary judgment motion, I tell associates that you really have to outline. Um, You can't just, you know, have a blank piece of paper in front of you and start writing. You need to outline the facts, the narrative, and then the legal issues and the arguments that you will be um, writing on. And I also say, use your own voice. Um, Obviously, in employment law, we're dealing with human issues and and personalities and what transpired um, between people. And so you wanna tell the story to the court in a succinct manner that comes across advocating for your client, um, but as well as hitting the legal and factual issues in a manner that is um, persuasive. Got it. And in uh, the affidavits that you consider in support of, of the motion, when you're thinking about who is going to sign those affidavits? What's what's your thought process? So oftentimes you have enough in the record, the plaintiff's deposition, um, the 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 company witnesses' deposition, the employer's witnesses' depositions that you might not need affidavits when going to file a motion for summary judgment because there's enough testimony there. Um, But where there is a lack of testimony on a key issue, you can certainly identify the individual who can sign that affidavit, company official, whether that's an HR representative or um, the decision maker in the the termination decision or the employment decision. Someone who has 
individual knowledge of the facts and circumstances that they are offering through an affidavit testimony to the court on. Got it. And and not every case really is uh, well positioned for summary judgment. What which kind of cases are less well positioned for summary judgment from your perspective? Well, I don't know that it's a category of you know employment discrimination versus FMLA cases. The cases that aren't poised for summary judgment are those where, as Pooja mentioned earlier, where there is a dispute of material fact, as we all know. And so my role as defense attorney is to identify that to my client and say, look, you know, we're going to have a hard time getting summary judgment because this is a he said, she said case. Um, You know, there's no witnesses to the key conversation. The plaintiff is saying one thing, our our client is saying another, and we're likely not going to get summary judgment. Um, and have candid conversations with your client about that. But it's really um, where there's a dispute of material fact, Scott. Okay, thank you. Judge Shalom, I want to talk about the body of the memorandum for a moment. Give us uh, your, maybe your um, top three or four piece of advice on writing a well-written summary judgment memorandum that's helpful to you. Well, uh, first piece of advice is is sort of standard for pretty much any brief, but certainly in this category as well. It's just to be as efficient and concise with your information as possible. I don't think I think less is more with any uh, motion brief, but certainly summary judgment where you're talking perhaps a lot of detail, a lengthy brief uh, bumping up against the page limits, um, being as efficient as possible, um, non repetitive. Uh, et cetera, is important. And I think that what that means, frankly, is leaving time at the end to edit down. I think sometimes lawyers throw it all on the page and whether it's a timing issue or otherwise, you get uh, something that just kind of is as long as it can be, but doesn't um, hone it down as necessary. And part of that is to prioritize your best arguments and not to necessarily make every argument you can possibly make, but to pick the ones that are most likely to succeed. Um, And also sort of calibrating uh, what you say to that. I mean, your your core argument, the one you think is your primary argument, should get the most time and attention, and you should convey that that's your primary argument in some fashion. Um, and then the lesser ones, secondary, alternative arguments, you know, stretch arguments, you should write less on, but also identify them in some fashion, because I think that does enhance the credibility of the whole package if uh, you acknowledge some arguments are stronger than others in whatever nuanced way you do that with the language. Um I also would not spend too much time on the legal standards. Sometimes you'll get two or three pages on what is the Rule 56 standard. And you can always go out and find a case that frames the language just a little bit better for your side. Um, But we do so many of these. We generally have our own view of what exactly the right way to frame the standard is. And you're not going to get us to change that uh, by finding a, a case that has particularly good language for you. So I would save the time and efficient, you know, I'd save your time and energy on the arguments themselves and not on the legal standard. And then I guess my third point would just be um, with the facts. Uh, you know, many of these motions are fact based and either showing you have a genuine dispute of material fact or not. And so I, I think, uh, again, honing in on the most important facts in the case, not just giving us the entire universe and making the judge look uh, in the haystack for the needle but really honing in on what the key facts are, I think can make it more effective. We have uh, really our first question here, which is is uh, relevant, I think, to this discussion. And that is the use of the plaintiff's deposition versus an, an affidavit. Uh, deposition excerpts versus an affidavit, whether they're contradictory or not, how do you parse all that out? Um, well, the... My general approach, if there's been a deposition, would be to um, hopefully have the parties rely on the deposition. There is the sham affidavit doctrine, which sometimes gets trotted out in opposition when you throw in an affidavit, saying, which says that if the affidavit contradicts the deposition, the deposition controls. And so knowing that that's what's going to happen, I think I would rely heavily on the deposition as Teresa said, sometimes there's things that weren't covered in the deposition or there's a witness without a deposition, in which case you can supplement with an affidavit on those points. But it's not usually that helpful to try to reframe what was said in the deposition differently because you bump up against that doctrine. Um, So it's probably more efficient since the deposition's already been 
done to focus on that and not try to recreate evidence. It's, it really kind of goes into your preparation for the deposition. I think it's really, um, it's hard to fix that later. Table of contents, table of authorities. Is it helpful to you? Um, well, we don't always get them like the appeals court, although in our local rules require them for, I think, something over 25 pages. Um, I would say it's helpful primarily, not necessarily on the first read, but when you're going back to look for something. So if uh, if you can uh, do that, and I know now with computers, it's not hard to, uh, it certainly is, uh, is appreciated. Judge Harris, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, attributes of a well-written opening brief that you see at the Fourth Circuit. First of all, thank you for having me. This has been already very illuminating for me. It's very interesting for me to hear about how this shakes out at the district court level. Um, I'm not sure I have anything to say that is specific to employment cases. Um, I would uh, echo what Teresa already said. I think the number one thing is outlining an organization. Um, I always, when I was in practice, I and I think this bears out now that I'm a judge, I would tell associates, put your time into the outlining. Um, if, if your issues fit together logically, if you've made clear kind of the steps of your argument, I think that is more important than fiddling around with individual words. So I would really put time into that. I think it is really important that people before they sit down to actually draft or as they are doing a redraft, they have already decided why they think they should win this case. Um, I sometimes get briefs where it is really clear that people are just spinning their wheels for the first 20 pages, just kind of showing their work. And at around page 20, they're like, aha, here's my argument. Um, and then the last 10 pages of the brief are good. Don't do that. If you have that aha moment at page 20, you have to go back and start again and frame your whole brief around just a very simple question. Why should I win this case? Um, and then the last thing I will do is add a little bit to um, what Judge Schwong said about um, the length and the importance of being concise. I do agree with that. Where you can be concise, you should be. And particularly in these very fact-based cases, um, you know, by the time you're on appeal, you're trying to persuade me, no, there's a genuine dispute as to a couple of critical facts. I would really focus in on those facts, why they're important, show me the dispute and not get lost in kind of the weeds. But I will say that I think um, uh, the shorter, the better, for sure. But there are times when a few extra words actually make something easier to read. Like, don't go back and cut out all of your road mapping because it will make it shorter. I appreciate the road maps. It's a few extra sentences, but now I know what I'm getting. The issue has been framed up for me more clearly. So I think sometimes new brief writers worry a little bit too much about making it short at the expense of making it readable. It is not always the case that those two things go hand in hand. And if I have to pick, I'd rather have it be a little bit longer, but you have explained yourself better. So judges, when they open that brief are maybe anxious readers initially, and they need that sense of trust. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I would, um, judges, well, I don't know, I, sh I shouldn't speak for all judges. I think many judges, myself included, we are very anxious readers. We like to have a sense of mastery of a case and sort of inevitably when you're picking up a case um, fresh, you don't, you, you don't have any sense of mastery. You don't have a sense of context. You don't know what's going on. And so I find extremely valuable sort of short introductions and appellate briefs that just kind of give me the lay of the land. This is what this case is about. I'm about to show you that there is in fact, the district court was wrong. There's a dispute of fact here. This has to go to a jury. I just find that very, very helpful at the outset. So I can start to feel comfortable with what's to come. I can situate myself for what I'm about to read. I also use, I think we um, talked a little bit about tables of contents. We do require tables of contents and I use those as outlines. I always read the table of contents first because that will again, give me just a really fast introduction into where this case is going. Got it. Uh, the best praise to give a brief is when it reads like an opinion. Yes. yes. Tell us about um, that. Yeah. So I feel like um, I was told this when I was writing briefs. I get it more now. If you can write a brief that um, reads like an opinion, it has sort of the the 
kind of neutral tone of an opinion, which is not to say that it's not a work of advocacy, but it's not a lot of like ad hominem attacks or anything like that. It has, you know, a neutral tone um, that sort of has a fact section that makes the reader kind of primes the reader to think the outcome you want would make some sense and then shows how you get there under the law and is careful about the precedent and synthesizes it where you have to. Then it's reading like a judicial opinion and that gives judges a huge amount of comfort. It's almost like, I'm not sure this is the right evidence doctrine, but like a performative utterance. Like, I don't know for sure that this brief is right, but I see that, um, you could write an opinion coming out this way and it would look like an opinion. Like this is this is an argument that will write. And I know that because you've already written it for me the way I would have to write it. Does that make sense? It sure does. Okay. Tables of contents are really important to you. Yes. Um, yeah, and this is why I say start with the organization, start with the outline that will turn into your table of contents because um, literally the first thing I read when I pick up a case is I take the three briefs, the opening, the um, response, and then the reply brief, and I read the tables of contents. And that is how I know, like, here's what this case is about. Here's what I should be reading for when I start actually reading the briefs. Here's where it's sort of, it's like a spoiler. It gives me sort of a hint of where we're going before I start reading, which just makes it much easier to contextualize what I'm about to read. So think about this when you do your headings, don't just think about how they look on the page where they appear. Think about how your table of contents looks as a result. Uh, let's talk about questions presented for a moment. Um, what should a, the appellant consider when framing their questions presented? Well, I very much agree with um, Judge Schwong. You should pick your battles. Um, you know, you can raise as many issues as you want on appeal, but I think almost inevitably by the time we're getting to, you know, issue number four, issue number five, that's our cue that you think this is your fourth or fifth least strong or fifth or fourth or fifth strongest argument. And, you know, I mean, every now and then a district court will get five things wrong, I suppose, but it's pretty unusual. Like if you haven't persuaded me on the first three, the odds that you're going to get me on four or five are pretty slim. So I would say pick your battles as few issues as you, you know, as you think are really, truly meritorious and, and be careful and selective in what you choose to appeal on. The uh, standard of review, know what it is and own it. Why is that so very important? So this is, um, I mean, the standard of review is so important to appellate judges. It absolutely frames the way we see an entire case. And on summary judgment, I mean, the fact that it's de novo review is really important. It means, you know, that not only are we reviewing if there are legal questions up on summary judgment, we're reviewing those de novo, that's not unusual, but we're also like, getting our hands like way into the facts because we have to review de novo the question of whether there is, you know, how did the district court review the record? Is there, does this record present a genuine question of fact? And I know like, my clerks are surprised year in and year out. Like, oh, I thought this was an appellate clerkship and here I am on, you know, page 900 of the record reading all the depositions, but that's what we do. And it is sort of unusual. Um, and it means that the, uh, the um, appellee cannot rely as much as would generally be the case on just kind of just defer to the district court judge as on everything that is factual, which is how more how we're primed to think about these cases, but not in this context. In this context, we really have to get in there and muck around in the record ourselves. Um, and so I think, you know, that's very helpful for the appellant. Um, and we will do that work and you should you know, encourage us to do it. That's the standard of review. And for the appellee, it means, you know, you really have to get in there and defend the district court's factual assessment or assessment of the factual record in a way you might not ordinarily have to do. Let's talk about the factual record for, for a moment. In crafting the statement of facts section in the opening brief, give us some advice on maybe how to do that in the most helpful manner for you. Yeah, this sort of goes back to what I said about um, the highest praise being this reads like an opinion. I think, 
you're just sort of balancing two things when you write your fact section. You want it to have a neutral tone. It should be written in a kind of neutral voice, um, objective, neutral voice, but it is absolutely a piece of advocacy, a piece of rhetoric that is sort of advocating for seeing the case your way. And that's, you know, a bit of a balancing act. Um, you ha it has to read objectively, but you absolutely are trying to make your case, try to explain by the time I finish reading the fact section, I should know why it would make sense to come out your way. You know, something bad happened to this employee or alternatively, employer's just trying to run a business here um, and nothing bad happened. Um, and I should have a, you should have presented the facts in a way that makes me hope I'll be able to come out your way under the law. Give us a sense of maybe some mistakes that you see appellate counsel make in their brief writing. One mistake in this, I don't want to be repetitive, but it goes back to the standard of review. I do think that sometimes lawyers find themselves on appeal and they think, oh, now I'm in front of the appellate court. This is all about the law. Um, and I get pages and pages and pages about the legal standard, as Judge Shuang said. Um, and people think like you're in appellate court. That's what we're here to talk about. Like, this is the standard for Title VII. This is the standard for summary judgment. And then they um, give short shrift to the factual record and tying their arguments to the factual record. And honest to God, there have been times when I have been, um, I have gotten appellate briefs like that and I go back and find the briefs from summary judgment. You go back into the record and find those briefs and those briefs are great, but those are the briefs I actually needed on appeal, the ones that really walk through the factual record. Um, and so don't, a, a common mistake is to think that it's the same mistake my clerks make, that because you're in an appellate court, it's all about law and it's not about facts anymore. That is absolutely not true. So you've got to continue to make your record-based and fact-based arguments. Um, I think that is my number one mistake, but hang on because I might have another. Oh yeah. This goes back to the tone question. Um, and I'm sure this is true in district court too. It's just not the place for kind of catharsis when you're writing briefs for being cranky about the other side, you know, the time they were late for the deposition or whatever. Like, it, it, no, um, it's not the right place for sort of ad hominem, like, like kind of throwing elbows at your colleague on the other side. Um, it, the tone is important. We're, we really are just trying to kind of in an objective way, resolve the case in front of us. And so at the same time, you obviously want to present your facts very sympathetically. It's just not the right venue for working out um, your angst about the case. Judge Wong, tone and tenor, I see you smiling. Uh, as Judge Harris was saying that, T tell us a little bit about uh, what you expect in tone and tenor in the briefs that are filed with you. Well, I mean, I would just echo what Judge Harris said on all these things and, and note that it is not necessarily or it is not different because we're at the trial court. It is true that um, certainly, you know, if there are hearings of some kind, um, witnesses at various points, you may be um, there may be points at which there was friction among the parties. But uh, the one that's sort of not showing that is going to avoid uh, creating distractions for the judge. And, and to some degree, you know, the credibility really is, you know, who's the professional advocate here? Who's the person who is trying to help us get what we need, which is not the the drama of what happened in the deposition, but is more of just the law and the facts stuck, uh, stitched together. And so I, I fully agree that, um, you know, being able to present yourself as the person who has uh, both a more authoritative understanding of the law and the facts and someone who's really focused on earnestly delivering those is always going to help. And and part of that also, uh, going back to something I said earlier, is um, being willing to maybe whether it's in the brief or in the argument, being able to, you know, acknowledge, again, the strengths of certain arguments, uh, acknowledge certain weaknesses does enhance your credibility on the things that you are pushing for as being um, your best arguments, because well, you understand they must be because you, you're, you're not going to, you know, you're, you, you can take a nuanced approach to it. So I think that's part of the tone is um, 
you know, really trying to calibrate what's the strong arguments, what's not, and therefore in- improving your credibility by showing that you're willing to uh, acknowledge gradations in your in your various arguments. Let's say there is a misrepresentation, unintentional, of course, that's made in a brief. How can one point that out to you, Judge Schlong, in a in a professional manner, so that you know you 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 pointed it out, but at the same time uh, not gone beyond that. Well, uh, you know, it's just it, it all comes down to language as as whether it's in your brief or in an argument. I mean, there's a difference between saying they lied and it was inaccurate. I know nowadays, uh, just in general discourse, the stronger, blunter language seems to be coming out more and more in the public square. Um, we're probably going to be the last people to move in that direction uh, in terms of what our preferences are. So uh, you fully get the un- I mean, there's no you're not going to miss uh, the judge is not going to miss the fact that there's an inaccuracy if you call it an inaccuracy or or um something like that or they they may have erred in saying this as opposed to you know, trying to mislead you judge um so you can just convey it with the right language most of the time judge long thank you to Harris, the uh, introduction in that opening brief is something you look at carefully um why is this important to you? Well, it's the, um, as I said, it's my first chance to kind of get my hands around the case and find out what is this case about. And it is, I mean, I'm coming to a cold, so it's your best, it's the brief writer's best opportunity to first and best opportunity to kind of get me on their side early by just briskly framing this is what this case is about. So I really, I think people should think very hard about an initial introduction and how they want the judge to first see their case. Um, And I will say judges are so busy. I mean, district court more than appellate. uh, You know, we, we make first impressions tend to be very sticky. We don't have a lot of time to go back and reconsider whether our first impressions are correct. So I just think you want to lead, you know, best foot forward. Um, a good introduction can really go a long way because it will be the context for everything we read after that. And man, those first impressions really count. Thank you. Pooja, let's talk about opposing a motion for summary judgment just for a moment. One school of thought is really uh, taking kind of a a rifle shot approach rather than using a shotgun, but you don't always agree with that. Tell us why. You know, if you have credible claims, you know, at the district court level in particular, I think we do want to include them, but it may be, as Judge Huang said, a matter of figuring out which is going to get more space in your brief. Uh, you may want to give more space to your strongest claims and then less space to your weaker ones. Uh, and then on appeal, with the benefit of the district court's reaction and opinion, you know that gives you another point to sort of pause and think about which claims you're actually bringing up. Because I do think on appeal, you're making... You know, it, it's also de novo review, but it's a different consideration. So you also take time to kind of build up your client and your client's story. Why is that important? You know, ultimately, especially at summary judgment, it's a matter of storytelling. And as a plaintiff, so where you have the benefit of representing a human and not necessarily a corporation. And there's, you know, it, it's important to build up the client and say, this is a real person that was affected by this decision. Uh, You you know, that's not to say that you're not focusing at all on the defendant's conduct, but when you're building the story, when you're building the narrative, uh, it's an easy way to really add color in life. Uh, But of course, you know, staying accurate to the record while you're doing that. Judge Harris talked about the importance of the statement of facts and you're arguing, but not arguing. Tell us about how you craft your statement of facts, your mindset. So the statement of facts is, I think, the most important part of the summary judgment brief. And Judge Harris said, you know, I think the goal is by the time you get to the end of the statement of facts, you want the reader to think, like, of course, it makes sense uh, that, you know, it's, it's possible for a jury to find that there is discrimination or whatever the issue is. And so that is a matter of just thinking about what facts you're including, making sure you're including your strongest evidence, thinking about whether you actually need to include things that are at the margins or maybe less relevant, uh, and just making sure you're actually drawing attention to and highlighting 
your best facts. Um, as a law clerk, you know, I can say that, especially when there are voluminous records, you know, you want to make sure that the law clerk and the judge know what your best facts are and don't expect that they will find facts that are favorable to you in the record if you haven't highlighted them in your fact section. At summary judgment, you believe that motivation matters. How do you kind of frame the motive of the defendant in your opposition to motion for summary judgment? I think inferences are where you, know, you want to draw attention to. And you know, while you need actual evidence of the facts that are underlying the inference, um, you want to point out what a jury can infer the motive to be. And I think doing you know, pointing out motive in the context of what the standard is at summary judgment is important. You know, it would be reasonable for the jury to infer X um, about motive and also maybe underlying issues. But you don't have to persuade the judge at this point at summary judgment that this is what the motive is. Uh, it's a matter of just pointing out that this is a reasonable inference and, you know, make sure you're thinking about that and the standard all the way throughout the brief. Putting your issue front and center and not kind of getting lost in the defense's opening brief, uh, how do you do that? I, I think the easiest way is not to start off every paragraph with defendant argues or defendant may argue. Um, you don't want to give them all the space in your brief. You would essentially be giving them extra pages. You know, when you're submitting your brief, you're controlling the narrative, you're handling the framing of it, and you want to center your framing and your approach to the story. Uh, you know, that's not to say that you shouldn't anticipate the other side's arguments, but you can do so more implicitly by, you know, distinguishing case law you expect them to cite or, you know, citing to record evidence that may undermine what they have cited. But, you know, it's not worth giving them too much space in your brief when this is, you know, especially in your opposition brief, one of the only chances you have because you may not have a sir reply. So the Supreme Court teaches us in Reeves versus Sanderson Plumbing that all that the non-moving party must do is simply demonstrate, call, call into question the legitimate business reason after they've identified the prima facie case. Do you believe it's important to argue not only uh, that, but also to argue really pretext plus in a case for the court? Why is that important? I think it's important to not you know, limit your advocacy in any way, especially if you have the record to support it. And, you know, considerations like shifting rationales or, or failure to follow protocols, they're all part of the same decision and they can be weaved together. Um, so you may not want to break out every argument you have for each possible pretext into its own separate paragraph, but think instead about how you can build it all up and, and weave it together because ultimately it's all part of the same decision and the same narrative. Judge Swong, if a party, uh, let's say, decides, it, decides to drop maybe some of their weaker claims, how do they do that? Do they lie down in the brief? Do they file a stipulation? What do you want to say? Well, I mean, I think to be clean, there'd be some sort of, you know, stipulation, motion to dismiss, uh, you know, voluntarily dismiss certain claims. But uh, honestly, I can't say I've really seen that very often. So um, I think the better, so, so the more realistic scenario is it can happen in a brief. So more likely it's, I guess it would be the um, non-moving party might say, well, we're not pursuing that particular argument after all. Um, I, I think it can be in the brief. Ideally, it's pretty clear and pretty explicit, um, both that it's not buried in a footnote somewhere, but also that, although it could be, um, but, but just that it's clear saying we're not pursuing this. If it's a little bit squishy, then it doesn't really help very much. If it says, well, you know, we, we're, we're, you know, we're not really relying on that. Like, does that mean that you're it's not something we have to talk about anymore? Or do we still have to talk about it because you're sort of possibly relying on it? And, and it does help if you, you know, carve out an issue. Um, sometimes it's, it's something that can come up at oral argument. Obviously, earlier the better, because we probably did some work leading up to the oral argument on this issue, only to find we don't need to include it. And it is, does create efficiencies because it might have been something you'd have to write several pages on and now you don't. 
but we also worked up this whole issue. Um, so if you knew in advance, you know, at the very beginning that you weren't going to pursue it, that would have been even more helpful. So earlier, the better and, and ex- as explicitly as possible. Does a party enhance their credibility if they're willing to identify some claims that they're not willing to pursue the claims that they think that are they think are the strongest and that they are pursuing to try? I, I think so. As I as, as I've said earlier, obviously, I, I don't want to encourage you know, a complaint with 20 claim, 20 claims, you can easily jettison, you know, some of them and, and get credit for that. I think it's more of, you know, particularly post discovery is when one could fairly and very, you know, in a very credible way say, look, we thought this might be a winning claim. We understand now with the depositions and so forth that we're not going to be able to win on that. So we're going to drop that. That's, that does enhance your credibility because it shows the, your, uh, willingness to um, follow the the facts as they come in and not sort of a knee jerk reaction as to, or we have to keep pushing through this, even if we've got nothing on it. So I I think it does help. Uh, Pooja mentioned uh, motivation evidence and assuming that the non-moving party wants to identify motivation evidence in their opposition, how do best, how do they best do that for you? I mean, I don't know if I put it into any special category other than I, I would agree that that is one of the key areas that can create a genuine issue of material fact. So um, certainly um, whether it's specific, I mean, not just statements made either at the time of an incident or, or at some other point that's still within the universe of relevant evidence, that's something that sometimes comes up. Sometimes you have um, just you know false statements or things that were said that, again, raise questions about the motivation if they give a pretextual reason for something or, you know, someone someone asks the employer why they did something and they give a reason that's just facially not accurate. So um, I don't know if I put, him in a, put that into a special category other than saying it's a very important evidence and so it should be highlighted in some fashion. And note that, you know, for example, you know, sometimes it's nice to connect it to not just explain, give the facts where, you know, maybe it does sound like this is not a good situation, but then tie it back to the standards that you're looking at. Is this pretext? Is this the lack of a legitimate non-discriminatory reason? Does this go to intent? You know, to put it, at least connect the dots to which part of the analysis this is uh, where we should really focus on this evidence. Retaliation claims, are they easier to frame in opposition to summary judgment from your perspective? I, I think they can be. I mean, it's it's pretty common, I would say, to have a case where you have discrimination and retaliation claims. The discrimination claim is tough uh, and the retaliation claim is a little bit easier to pursue for two reasons. One is the standards lower on certain things like the adverse employment action or materially adverse action. It doesn't have to be that the person was actually fired. It can just be that they were treated in a way that would cause them not to want to file a complaint, which is a lower standard under Burlington Northern. And and that can make a big difference in terms of how everything gets weighed. Um, And then secondly, just I think many times the evidence is going to be a little bit more clear because I think there's still employers who aren't really fully aware of the retaliation um, prohibition or at least or what would constitute retaliation. So it is one of those things where you, you will frequently have cases where the discrimination evidence is, is a harder sell than the retaliation evidence. And I think for purposes of the plaintiff side, knowing that uh, that may be the case, that you work hard to make sure you at least keep your retaliation claim. And then from the defense side, just understanding that that could be where you have greater vulnerabilities and you need to focus on that. In employment cases, what are some of the mistakes that you see employee counsel make in opposing summary judgment? In opposing employee counsel. Okay. Um so this is the opposition brief right. that the employee council is filing in opposition to the motion for summary judgment. Well, I, I think from their perspective, you know, I think Pucha had a really good point about not sort of playing entirely on the other side's uh, terms in terms of just responding to their arguments. They do need to be responded to. I mean, I think a lot of times parties don't listen to each other enough. So you, you don't respond to something where you answer a question or you respond to an argument they haven't actually really made. So that's important. Um, so I think uh, it, it's a it's a fine line between letting them the other side dictate the exact framework of what you're doing, but also making clear making it uh, uh, you know being able to actually address their arguments and perhaps not 
you know, attack arguments that don't exist or that they didn't really make. And you just create a, a more difficult environment for yourself. So I, I think I think the biggest mistake would be not really focusing on what the defense is saying in their brief. Um, not to say, again, you have to just respond directly to it uh, linguistically, but knowing what they're arguing, knowing what they're not arguing and frame your, your brief to address that and not um, not help the other side out by either creating arguments that they didn't make or avoid or failing to address important things that they do raise. Judge Harris on appeal, what are you seeing are some of the mistakes that employee counsel are making in opposing summary judgment at the district court level? Right, I'm sorry, who's opposing the summary judgment? So this um, is the employee's counsel, the employee opposing summary judgment, and then now you're seeing it up on appeal. Okay, so they won the summary court, judgment and now it's on appeal. That's it, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Um, well, I, I actually want to start by echoing what Judge Chong just said. Um, there are times when I get the two briefs and I almost have to like make a chart for myself. I do. I literally have to make a chart. Like they said this and then I'm like trying to figure out, oh no, okay, but they said this and I have to map that out for myself. That should not happen. Like now I'm already annoyed. Like you, you've lost me. Um, the, the, the responsive brief has lost me because they didn't do that work for me. And I totally agree that as a matter of rhetoric, you don't have to track the structure of the opening brief. You don't have to um, write defensively. They said this, but that's wrong for this reason. State your case affirmatively, but please, I beg of you, um, connect the dots for me. Say, here's my case, and that's why they're wrong to say X. And here's another piece of my case, and that's why when they say Y, that can't be correct. Like, just don't make me make a chart. Um, and, and I absolutely agree that people can kind of lose their reader by uh, either not being responsive or being responsive, but not making clear how they have responded. So th that is a pet peeve of mine. And I'm really glad um, it was raised. Um, now, and <laughs> I've lost the thread of your actual question. This is sort of mistakes people make in um, so that, defending. That looking at the, re you know, the record below and the opposition to the motion for summary judgment, maybe uh, some, some opportunities not had, some mistakes made. Yeah, I think um, so. If you're you're defending the grant of summary judgment and they're coming in, um, one mistake, and I, I hate to sort of cycle back, is uh, not fully engaging with the assessment of the factual record in the way that we are going to be prepared to do on de novo review, um, and relying a bit too much on the idea that well, the district court already said there was no. There's no actual genuine dispute of fact on that. And surely you will agree because, you know, we won't surely agree. We actually take very seriously the obligation to go back and make sure that we read the record in the exact same way. So just being clear about tethering your arguments to the record. Um, and then I also think, uh, you know, we've talked about how you, the, the fact section, by the time you finish reading the fact session, fact section, you ought to, it ought to make sense. You, someone reading it um, should want to rule for you. Um, it, it, that should seem like the only sensible outcome. But man, if you skip the second part, like explaining over on the law side, how I can rule for you consistent with the law, um, that also can be very aggravating. It's almost the worst of all possible worlds. You've made me want to rule for you, but you haven't shown me how to rule for you. So now I'm just very depressed and upset. Um, so it is really important to make your kind of common sense slash empathetic argument in that front section, but you got to like close the deal over in the law section by using those facts, combining them, synthesizing them with the law and showing why, you know, you win under the governing law. And I think sometimes um, in employment cases, and I have seen this on both sides, um, lawyers doing a phenomenal job of making someone want to rule for them in the fact section, just like really telling a compelling story, but not closing the deal over in the law section. Thank you. Judge Shalong, let's talk about pretext evidence for a moment. And one of the areas is comparator 
evidence. So being treated differently from others who are similarly situated. What do you want to see in order to frame that issue so that uh, it's, it's a, for you, relevant and material? I mean, sometimes, I mean, the parties are going to be limited by really what the evidence is. And I know at the motion to dismiss stage, we often get um, arguments that, well, the comparator description is too vague. It's not targeted to a particular person. We don't really know what happened in that situation. And and that can be a decent scenario. For, I mean, uh, argument to make is that we don't have enough information. But at, at, at summary judgment, you hopefully have developed that evidence. So if you said there was a comparator, if you're the plaintiff side, you need to work pretty hard to develop that, whether it's deposing the comparator or the, the HR people who made a decision about the comparator or what have you, um, so that you can go into that situation at summary judgment and be pretty specific about either this person or this group of people, um, ideally in the same time frame with the same supervisor, but Again, whatever you have to work with, you work with your best evidence, um, was treated similarly uh, or di- diff- differently than I was because we're in different classes. And so I think specificity is really important. I, As I said, I think we can be more permissive at, with that at the motion to dismiss stage because we know you have imperfect information. At this stage, you should have pretty strong information. And so if you've developed it, you should be able to lay it out pretty specifically. I mean, I do think particularly given the standard of you know, genuine issue material fact, I don't necessarily look for perfect alignment. I think from the defense side, uh, they often argue, well, this isn't perfect alignment because you know this person wears a red cap to work and, and our person wears a blue cap to work. So they're different. I mean, I, there's some point at which, um, you know, obviously you're going to point out whatever distinctions you can, but I wouldn't hang my hat on the fact that you can identify a difference here or there because ultimately to me at least, the question of whether this person's comparison is a fair one to make can very well be an inferential step that the jury gets to decide. So I think if the plaintiff can lay out a very specific comparator, it's a tough sell to say that we can't go to the jury. Um, the defense certainly um, can and should identify whatever differences you can. But but again, they should you should really look for big differences, like if it was a completely different supervisor or a different branch office. Um, rather than sort of, and and focusing on what the biggest differences are, rather than a laundry list of everything that you can see that's different between, you know, the where's Waldo on one side and the where's Waldo on the other side. Uh, Other forms of pretext evidence to demonstrate intent. Uh, Employer dissembling. Is that something that you find persuasive? If it's in the opposition? I mean, sure. I, I think, you know, I mean, the reality is, is my guess is in most of these cases, you know, the, the plaintiffs are limited to certain key pieces of information they can extract somehow. And so if that's what you've got, that's what you've got. Um, I think the tricky part sometimes, well, one is to just really show where there's a, either a, a misstatement or something that seems untrue coming from the employer. But I think the last step that, at least from the plaintiff side, one should try to, to push forward on is trying to connect that to does it support an inference of discrimination? Because even though you're getting pretty far down the road, there there are scenarios where the other side, the defense can certainly argue they may have lied, but there was there was a different reason for it. And it wasn't because of discrimination, it was because of something else. They, they, they really wanted to get their friend into this job. And so uh, assuming you can't make some other argument associated with that, that that's why this all happened. And you have to at least be able to explain why that the jury gets to decide that you know your explanation is still a legitimate one that it was tied to race or gender or something else and so i think sometimes the lawyers skip that last step um of, of trying to connect it back to the protected class post hoc justifications or shifting reasons for the adverse action uh are those compelling to you i mean i think they fall in the same category i mean they can be um they can be pretty powerful but not necessarily a smoking gun uh, if there is a good explanation coming from the other side. And that's why sort of to advise the defense side, I think being able to provide an explanation, um, obviously it can't just be only one of several reasonable ones because then the jury gets to decide it, but, but being able to really establish that there was another reason for all that that was um, legitimate and not related to the to the protected class is important from the defense side. Thank you. Judge Harris on appeal, uh, shifting reasons or not being truthful about the underlying facts. Are, are those things that the, the appellant should point out 
the employees council in their brief that they filed with the Fourth Circuit? Yeah, I think so. Um, and I agree with Judge Chong, obviously, you know, the law is that, that it, that's not sufficient. Um, doesn't make your case that you can show shifting rationales or some untruths by the um, employer. But I feel like those leave a pretty, those leave a mark. Um, you know, you can't help but have questions about the credibility of what you're hearing from someone who already has said one non-credible thing on the subject. Um, it matters. And I think particularly if all you're saying is, so I should get to a jury, a jury should now be allowed to sort of figure out, um, should I trust this new explanation? I feel like those things are pretty helpful, um, you know, both legally, but kind of atmospherically too. I wouldn't, if I were representing a plaintiff, I would not uh, miss the chance to put that pretty front and center in front of an appellate court considering your case. Again, especially if at the end of the day, you're not saying, so you should direct summary judgment in my favor. You're just saying, look, these people say things that aren't true about this. Let's let a jury get in here and start assessing credibility. I think that's a pretty compelling argument. Not that it is fully understanding the legal standard and you know we follow the law, but that that is not an argument I would leave unmade. Thank you. Judge Swong, failure to follow protocols. An employer has protocols, but it deviates in the particular case. Uh, is that something that should be pointed out in the opposition to the most for summary judgment? Certainly. I mean, I think it falls in the same kind of category uh, that Judge Harris was pointing out. I mean, like I said, I, I think the reality is, is, you know, if a plaintiff has all of these different categories we're talking about, it's probably a lucky day for them. I think usually it's harder to get all that kind of evidence in the same case. Um, and maybe if you do, the case might settle anyway, so we wouldn't be here. So, you know, you're probably going to have, I mean, you may have a case where that's the primary thing you have. And, and again, it may or may not carry the day, but you certainly are going to put it front and center um, and explain why, not just that this was a deviation, but hopefully some, if you've gathered the evidence, some explanation of how important it is that they do it a certain way, how historically they have done it that way. And for some potentially nefarious reason in this instance, they didn't. So I think it's not just pointing out the discrepancy, but given the context for how significant it might be in the way the company works, which again, requires you to have thought about that during the discovery stage and made sure you gather that information. Thank you. Pooja, one thing you try to do in your opposition brief is to anticipate what's in the reply. How do you do that? I think by the time you're briefing summary judgment, you should know what's coming from the other side. Uh, you know, you probably know what the arguments were in the opening brief and sort of similarly, you should know what's coming in the reply brief. And, you know, it sort of goes to some of what um, I was saying earlier in that you want to take the wind out of their sails. You don't want to give them uh, a chance to raise an argument and reply that you should have expected. And so whether that is by, you know, distinguishing case law um, in your opposition or, you know, getting a handle on the facts and framing the good facts that you have in a way that, uh, undercuts the facts that they're likely to come back with. Um, I think it's important to do that in the opposition. So hopefully, you know, their reply is really just a regurgitation of the opening brief. Uja, thank you. Teresa, I want to talk about the discovery process and how you really set up a case for summary judgment. Let's talk about the plaintiff's deposition for a moment. Uh, how many hours do you spend preparing for a plaintiff's deposition? Well, first, I'm going to give you a lawyer answer, which is it depends. Um, and second, I'm going to tell you what my partners told me is don't give away all the secrets. But no, I'm happy to talk about how long I take to prepare. A plaintiff's deposition is clearly, obviously, the most important piece of discovery that from a defense perspective, we are engaging in um, and looking at. And so it's very important to go in um, adequately prepared, and that means reviewing all the relevant documents, gathering your exhibits, identifying those exhibits, drafting an outline. Um, the first time I drafted an outline for one of the partners in my firm, I think it was, you know, 15 pages, and he said, where's the other 65? <laughs> so, um, you know, there are a lot of things to go through. Again, it depends on the claims um, in the case, how many counts there are what the nature of um, the allegations are, 
how long the employee's been employed. I mean, I know some of that might be time barred, arguably, but you're, you are going through um, employment history, um, performance at the employer, and then information related to what evidence the employee believes there is to show that there is pretext. And so to give an hour estimate on how much time it takes um, I would say, you know, a good defense attorney is spending the better part of two days preparing for a deposition. You're preparing the entire time um, from the time you get the complaint, maybe even the charge of discrimination, right? Because a lot of times uh, in most discrimination cases, um, you you have to exhaust your administrative remedies as an employee. And so we as defense counsel might be involved in the charge phase. And so you're gathering facts and identifying the issues from that stage forward. But preparing is the most important thing you can do as not only a defense attorney, but a plaintiff's attorney as well. What are some of the mistakes that you see employee counsel making in preparing their client for the deposition with you? Um, That's a great question. And I think this applies on both sides of the V, which is not preparing them sufficiently. And I don't mean, you know, preparing them, uh, you know, obviously as to what to testify to, but preparing them for the rigors of a deposition. I think a lot of times people sit down in the chair across from me and don't know that we're going to go all day, do not know that, uh, you know, it's an uncomfortable process, might not know that there's going to be a video taken of them and come in sitting down with with some sort of annoyed attitude and because the the other attorney hasn't prepared them. And that goes for defense attorneys too, that the individual sitting in the chair is not prepared to respond professionally, um, understand that you know this, this is part of litigation, understand the process, understand why it's going on. And so preparing the witness, whether it's you know the plaintiff or defense witnesses, for the rigors of a deposition, um, what it means, why it's being um, conducted. Um, I think that is the most uh, problematic uh, issue um, in preparation. So apart from the deposition of the plaintiff, what are some of the other discovery tools that are kind of your go-to tools that you use in every case? Sure. Um, Obviously written discovery is important, although, you know, it depends on the nature of the claim. And I know this is employment discrimination, but we might not use interrogatories in in wage and hour cases where, you know, it's not worthwhile. But in any event, interrogatories, requests for production of documents are very important. Um, You want the documents before you're taking the deposition uh, because otherwise you're, everyone's going to have to come back if they're produced later. So uh, you do want to get those documents prior to the deposition so that you have them and can question the plaintiff or the witness on those documents. Um, One underutilized, I think, um, discovery tool is, well, I'll say two. One is request for admissions, um, which can be helpful after some discovery in streamlining the issues. Um, If you, you know, have have the other side admit, can admit to um, facts that are pretty, um, I wouldn't say irrelevant, but that the employee received the handbook or that they understood that they were employed by this employer as opposed to that one. I think requests for admissions can be useful. In addition, third party discovery, I think is underutilized, issuing subpoenas to For medical records, of course, you're going to want to do that if there's compensatory damages claimed or if it's an ADA or FMLA case. Um, But third-party discovery from previous employers can be very helpful. We've had lots of cases where the employee has a propensity to engage in the behavior that they were ultimately terminated for at you know, my client, from my client. So uh, maybe they were terminated for attendance reasons at another employer, and then they had the same issues at my client. So I can use that potentially in a summary judgment motion to say, look, this isn't the first time that this employee has engaged in this behavior and it's led to terminations at other employers too. Um, In addition, unemployment records, I know I'm talking a lot. So 
Um, unemployment records, if there's a, if the employee applied for unemployment and there was an appellate, uh, excuse me, an appeal of that decision, there might be a record that is useful and includes the plaintiff's testimony on why they think they were fired, fired and you can use that, you know, in preparing for a deposition. Teresa, thank you. Of course. Judge Harris, I want to uh, shift to the response brief that is filed. Uh, this would be the response brief by the employer uh, after summary judgment has been granted. Uh, what's the primary goal of the response brief that's filed with you from, from where you sit? I think that if the employee's brief was good, there may be some uh, rehabilitative work to do in the facts section to kind of present the story differently um, so that the the appellate judge is sort of keenly aware of the um, the employer's side of the story going into the legal section. Um, and then in the legal section, I guess I would say the opportunity I think people sometimes miss, and we've talked around this already, is the opportunity, you know, not to be um, defensive. You, you don't have to um, sort of adopt the framing and the legal framing and structure of the opening brief. You can tell your story however you want, legally as well as factually, um, just so long as you are kind of clear where the points of contention are. But I do think there is an opportunity there to um, reframe not only the factual story, but also the kind of pertinent doctrine so that it runs a little bit more in your direction. Uh, maybe an underutilized section of that responsive brief. What, what might that be? I think the fact section, um, the the chance to sort of reorient someone's kind of general picture of what this story is about. I think it's just very important. If the um, if the opening brief was good, you know, um, who just said this? These are like real people, um, and there's a human story that's being told in the opening brief. And it's just really important, I think, to try to, uh, you know, without like, without saying anything, um, ad hominem isn't quite, quite the right word, without actually sort of picking at that story, just presenting, well, here's the other way to look at what happened here um, in the fact section. I think that's really important. And it's kind of, um, you know, after I've read the opening brief, I spend the the first thing I want to know when I get to the next brief is what's their story on the facts. Like I will spend a lot of time on that fact section to make sure that I'm getting a balanced picture of what happened here. Moving to the reply brief, what's the the proper structure of that reply brief? I think it's, it's personal preference. I think judges feel differently about this. I think a reply brief ought to be a standalone brief. Like it, it should make sense, even if I'm not reading it next to the brief that it is responding to. So I think it should start with a reformulation of the affirmative case. Here's why I win my case. And then I think it can go just briskly through anything it needs to respond to from the responsive brief. But I, I would not, I, I don't like opening a brief and having like the first paragraph be what they said on page 20 of their brief is not correct. And here's why. Um, I think it ought to stand alone as a statement, like once again, of why you should win your case. To underscore your point about the importance of the tables of contents, you read all those tables of contents first. I do. I do. I know some people say they start with the reply brief um, because it'll tell you fastest how the issues are joined. Um, but I, I think it's faster <laughs> to read the tables of contents. Um, because, right, as I said, it's sort of like you get a picture of the whole arc of the case before you dig in so that you have context for when you start reading. And can I actually, in terms of context, can I add one thing about the fact section? Because I know we've been talking about this at a fairly high level of abstraction, like how you want to tell your story. One thing that I always tell brief writers to consider is that a straight chronology without any cues about what is important and why is very hard to hold in your head. Like if I open up a fact section and it is just, here's what happened, you know, 10, 10, 15 pages 
of just a chronological narrative of what happened, that is very hard to retain because you're not giving the reader any signal as to um, why does this matter? What should I be reading for? Which words in this sentence are the key words? So I just implore people first to think about whether chronology is the right way to structure your fact section. You might want to do it around various issues rather than chronologically, particularly if, um, you know, like if there's a discrimination claim and a retaliation claim, the chronology may not separate out the facts that are important to each of those claims. You might just want to have two separate fact sections or divide your fact section by claim. Um, but if it is going to be a straight chronology, this is another thing where a few extra words that it might make it a little bit longer, but it'll really be easier to read if you just sort of tip off the reader, like, I'm about to tell you the stuff about why I can show that this was about discrimination. <laughs> Just like, tell me why I'm about to read the next couple of paragraphs in your chronology before I read them. Um, because it will allow, it, it, it'll give me context that will allow me to retain what I'm reading much, much better. Some uh, legal writing instructor I really like compares um, fact sections that are like someone spraying you with a hose, right? You're just getting drenched with facts and someone pouring everything into individual glasses and handing them to you. And each glass is sort of a little bit of an inter um, internal roadmap that says, here's what I'm about to tell you, here's why it's important, and here it is. So I really, I just think it is very hard. It's not a novel. Like just a, a pure chronology is very, very hard to retain for a legal reader. Thank you. Ted Schwong, uh, can we talk about oral argument for a minute? Uh, you mentioned it before. When do you schedule oral argument on motions for summary judgment? So we were just told um, that our, our bench bar committee continues to press for more uh, oral arguments and hearings on, on motions. I think our district perhaps... I haven't surveyed others, but perhaps my understanding is we don't do it as often as a district as some other districts and as much as the lawyers would like. Um, you know, when I first started, I, I, I met judges who always did arguments and never did arguments. Uh, and I ended up somewhere in between. The in between really is more of just an efficiency issue. I think I would always like to hear argument. Uh, doesn't I'm not saying it's going to change the end result. It often helps to frame the issues better, may make, make it easier to write an opinion, um, and sometimes will, at a minimum, will make you feel stronger about, uh, or the judge feel stronger about whatever uh, conclusion the judge is reaching, and sometimes it might change the outcome on a certain issue. So I would prefer to have it all the time, but I admittedly don't do it all the time, it just as a matter of keeping everything else moving. So I think the focus usually is when there's... Um, Two or three reasons. One would be um, there is a, well, just putting them into broad buckets. One is if I'm really not totally sure how this is going to turn out, I, I always try to seek out more information and the argument provides that opportunity. Another is if there is a theory under which um, we're pursuing, we think may help resolve the case, but it wasn't fully well developed in the briefing, maybe sometimes isn't really raised in the briefing, or relies on a case that neither side found, but is pretty important. It's an opportunity to give them a chance to uh, address whatever thoughts I've had that are independent of the briefs themselves. Um, if the parties ask for argument, that's going to at least be a factor, but not dispositive by itself. Um, and then I think sometimes if there's confusion on a, a factual issue or a legal question, or if we think maybe they're acknowledging this argument is off the table, we don't need to deal with it, but it's not really clear. Uh, having the argument can help us nail that down, maybe save ourselves some trouble in terms of addressing an issue that is no longer needed. Uh, that's not to suggest that you should create ambiguity that would sort of force us to have questions and get the argument. Um, but sometimes that's how it turns out. So let's say we're lucky enough to have oral argument before you. Maybe some advice to those of us who are preparing for that argument before you? Well, understanding, as I said, that we don't do it in every case, there's got to be a reason for it. And it usually is some unanswered questions, whether it's about any of the topics I just raised. And so I think one of the things that perhaps can happen at either level, but I think the appellate advocates are probably more attuned to the idea it's going to be a QA. and a I tend to try to treat it the same way as a Q&A with me asking most of the questions. And so if it's uh, so, I think one of the I, you certainly should remember what your best arguments were. But at this point, we've really 
hone through the briefs. And if we have questions about the briefs, we'll ask about them. So I think being able to be ready to answer any potential questions on your weak areas and so forth is more important than just sort of being able to distill your brief into oral form, because we do tend to uh, don't have strict time limits like in the appeals court, but obviously we've got other hearings, other cases. And so um, if you're just going to regurgitate what you said in the brief, we may not have just had the hearing. So I'd rather you focus on being ready to answer questions and then try to answer them directly rather than trying to, to push out an argument that you've already made in writing. Thank you. Judge Harris, oral argument uh, in, especially in employment cases, just uh, some advice for those preparing for orga- oral argument at the Fourth Circuit. A few things that, that they should consider, maybe right at the start. They should prepare a lot. I, th- I think like great oral advocates are not born, they are made by preparation. Um, you want to prepare a lot so that you can do what Judge Strong is saying you have to do. And it's true for us too. Uh, if all you can do is recite your theory of the case from your briefs, you're not helping yourself. We already read your briefs. You need to be prepared enough that you can kind of be nimble. You're not stuck with your talking points. You can listen to where the judges are and try to respond to their questions and their concerns. Cause we're not like, we're not just asking rhetorical questions. If we're asking questions, it's because we could use the answer. Um, and so, and the only way to do that is to prepare. There are no shortcuts. You just have to really know your case. So prepare, 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 try to do a moot court if you can, and not a friendly moot court, like not just like a bunch of people who are likely to see the case the same way you do. You got to try to put together a panel where you'll get a little bit of pushback. Um, but I just think be ready to meet the judges where they are. We think of this as you know, oral argument, at least I think of it, I think my colleagues do do too. This is like a chance for you guys to help us. We are desperate for your help. Cases are hard. You know, I have 16 cases at a time when I go to Richmond. They're all bouncing around in my head. I could really use the help and I will come with questions that will help me to decide the case. So just be prepared to have, you know, an honest to goodness conversation with us about what is difficult about your case. And also, I do want to say these cases, so many of them do turn on, you know, questions of credibility. Um, It's just really important. I think maybe especially always, but especially in this context, like don't get up and say stuff that's not true, Um, even if it's by mistake. Like, just don't do that, because once you we're all really prepared and once you say something that we know is not going to bear out on the record like i kind of stop listening like why why would i listen and you're saying stuff that's not true and not only that you sometimes have to fight a tendency to almost like impute that to your client like maybe your client is lying about why they fired this person cuz you just got up and said something that is not true about the record it's almost like yet another version of the pretext evidence like you're not even being honest about it right here in front of me. Now, suddenly I'm thinking, wow, maybe your client really did discriminate and lie about it. So really be careful. Even honest mistakes may come across as dis- as dissembling or dishonest. Um, so you really, really, if you don't know the answer to a question, say you don't know. Much better than guessing about the record and turning out to be wrong. Thank you. Judge Long, uh, is it ever a good idea to ask for a status conference when a motion for judgment, summary judgment, has been fully briefed and pending for a significant period of time? Um, probably not. I mean, I think there may be. I, I know, uh, you know, when I first started, I remember, uh, or before I started, there, there, we, I was a, as a lawyer, we had a case where the motion had been sitting there for nine months and. We're all sitting around griping about how the judge was probably just off playing golf and this is terrible. It's a travesty. And um, when I got here, I saw the caseload. And I mean, even with the the things that were set in place to try to move us along, it's very difficult, particularly if you want to do a good job on something. And these summary judgment motions are fact intensive to 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 uh, get through these in the time frame that the lawyers would like. And so. Uh, we know, particularly if, if uh, we, we know that we're not getting it out as fast as you would like, we're trying to do a good job. And I think we we know that. I, I think there may be opportunities if there's some other reason in the case, if you're just dying for information or your client's dying for information, if there's some other opportunity where there's something else going on in the case where we have a conference for some other reason where you need to file something, maybe you can sneak in a question about timing to explain. It to, to, but I, I probably wouldn't do it on a straight um we just want to know. We just want to remind you we have this case. Um, 
particularly, I mean, you know, maybe if there's a new development, you would pass something on if it's really relevant. I mean, sometimes we get those, you know, notice of a new case that might be relevant. And so might be an opportunity in there to, to ask a question somehow, but I, I wouldn't make it the primary purpose of a communication. Uh, what we always tell folks is if, if you want it faster, we have this great program where you can consent to have a, a magistrate judge handle the motion. And many of our magistrate judges end up being district judges. So it's the same thing. It just might go faster. So that's your solution if you're uh, not, not uh, happy with the timeline. Thank you for your brutal honesty. We appreciate it. We are ready for final thoughts. Teresa, start us off. Final thoughts. Well, um, I think one of the questions you posed to me earlier, Scott, was what makes an associate a go-to um, management employment counsel? And I think this applies to, to everyone practicing in this area of law, which is you have to become an expert in this area. It is very, um, there are a lot of different facets of employment law and to be credible to the court, to the judges, um, like the judges on this panel, you have to know uh, the law and how the facts apply to the law. So always master the, the area, master the facts and treat other lawyers, um, opposing counsel, the courts, uh, court reporters with respect. Um, we're, we're all here doing a job. You can be a very strong advocate without being a jerk. And so that is, that is my closing thought. Thank you. Pooja? Uh, so this is a piece of advice as someone who clerked, and I had the pleasure of clerking for Judge Schwag, um, more so than as the plaintiff's side lawyer, but just make the record in the summary judgment uh, case as user-friendly as possible. Make sure you're following the judge's case management order. There may be you know, rules in there about submitting a joint record that you would need to confer about beforehand. Um, think about the order in which the exhibits are organized and on appeal that may mean organizing them by UCF number, for example. Uh, but really just make it as simple as possible. You don't want you know, it to require more time for the, the court than it you know, needs when it has you know, the rest of the motion to focus on. Thank you. Judge Wong. Well, great advice. Um, no, I, I, I would add a couple other things. One is definitely think about, particularly in these employment cases, whether the motion for summary judgment even needs to be filed. Um, some of these things really are fact-based. And I don't know the details of how what counsel's con conversations with their clients are, whether they really want the motion filed or don't want it filed. But as you, based on everything we've said to do this the right way, it's a huge lift for both sides, counsel and for the court. And for the counsel, that means a client paying for it. Um, if there really are factual disputes. I mean, trials, of course, are, are even more expensive and time consuming, but losing a summary judgment motion is a lot of effort for little gain. And so when it is very fact-based, think about exactly you know what you're trying to accomplish here and is it worth it overall in the case. Sometimes that, I mean, I think there is a tendency to just say this is the next step in the, in the sequence. And I think at least giving that clear thought and discussing with your clients is really important. And then the other thought, just to give a different view from just the exigencies of what we do here at the district court, as I just kind of laid, laid out. Um, I know there's sort of a, a sort of a, a convention around the, the three different briefs in the appeals court, and they all have different, very important roles there. Um, because of that, we've mirrored the structure here where we do allow for the reply brief. But I think given how much is going on here, I, I would really ask uh, the practitioners at our court to really try to put as much as they can into those first briefs from each side and keep the reply brief to be really only for new information. I think sometimes they do end up being just a rehash of what was said in the first brief. Um, maybe they could be a little more nuanced about what they do with it, as Judge Harris said, but practically it doesn't happen that often. And so I think keeping it focused is, is helpful to us to keep the cases moving because um, sometimes the parties feel like they have to fill up all the space and they just kind of move words around from the first brief and that's all we get. Thank so you. if you're going to do it, make it count and make it, make it something new and different. Thank you. Judge Harris. Second, everything that has already been said. And I will just very briefly come back to something I said about oral argument, but it really applies at the briefing level too. Um, I think when I was in practice, it is, it was easy for me to feel like I was in kind of an oppositional relationship to judges, you know, like, and particularly at oral argument, like I, you know, 
they're shouting questions and I'm just like, I'm, I'm it's me against them. Um, as a judge, I can really assure you, and I wish I had understood this better, it feels intensely collaborative from this end with the lawyers. Like I really am counting on lawyers to help me get to the right answer in these questions. I am acutely aware of how much I am depending on their help, on their briefs to sort of make clear what the issues are and present them to me and point me in the right direction on facts and law, and then an oral argument to help me sort of figure out what I'm missing yet. Um, and so I, I just think if I would have had a lot more fun as a lawyer, if I had fully understood how much I could be of assistance to the court and how much the court appreciated that. So my final grace note is just that we really appreciate all the help we get from lawyers. Our jobs feel very hard. We are deeply grateful for the help we get from all of the lawyers and the fact that people are on this um, session, like trying to do better by their clients and by the courts is really lovely. And we uh, thank you for the help. Uh, we so much appreciate your participation. Thank you to Judge Pamela Harris, Judge Theodore Schwong, to Pooja Shechi, to Teresa Teer for making this a terrific panel. For more on the Federal Bar Association Maryland chapter, you can find us at www.fbamd.org. For future programming from the Metropolitan Washington Employment Lawyers Association, go to www.mwela.org. Really appreciate you joining us today.